colleagues. I suppose, firstly, firstly, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. But a couple of things that just arising from the the, uh, the speech, I think, are important. And firstly, I would very much welcome. Uh, the TETRA research that was presented here this morning because certainly it's something that we're very mindful of. Uh, any new research that comes in relation to anything that might impact on the health and safety of our members is certainly very welcome. So again, I'd like to thank you for the uh, offer of that research and certainly uh, the Executive Director of Human Resources and People Development uh, with the Health and Safety section will look at that. I suppose the second thing that strikes me is in terms of uh, a nuisance and um, I certainly don't see any members of Mungardi Shikhan as a nuisance, and most definitely not uh, members represented in this room from sergeant and inspector rank. Uh, quite the opposite. And I was asked the very same question outside by the media. Uh, when I said out there, I repeat here, and um, to extend to all of your members, I think the experience present, represented here in this room today, and the collective experience, wisdom of all of our members right across the organisation, but particularly people at sergeant and inspector rank, is critical in terms of making sure that we continue to improve the service that we provide to the community. So I absolutely uh, thank you for that, and I certainly look at it in that way. And I suppose the first thing that I wanted to do before I said that is to thank you in general. Not alone to thank you for the tremendous work you've done over the last few years to keep your communities and our country safe, with fewer people and less resources. And I know that that has put great professional and in some cases personal strain on people that are represented here in this room and on all of our members of all ranks. It's not been easy, but I would say it's been absolutely necessary. One of the great opportunities offered by a conference such as this is the opportunity to stop, register and express gratitude on behalf of our own organisation, the service that we provide, but also the nation. I'd also like to thank you over the last 12 months to your support to me. Uh, and I suppose when I stood at your conference last year, I was in an unusual position as well, probably a position that no other uh, commissioner in the history of Ungarda Shikona has been in. It certainly wasn't easy, and the last 12 months of the build-up to that wasn't easy on anybody in the room. So I thank you all very much for your support in that and for having the patience and the willingness to engage with us and listen as we went through those times of uncertainty. And certainly un until the very end of last year, we had no certainty. And I think that's an important uh, marker to lay down. And it was only very late last year we got certainty. certainty. So we're, starting, we're now at the start of a new part of that journey. Uh, and I would also like to thank you very much for your individual and your collective constructive input during that 12 months on how we can change for the better. And I know there are people here in this room and there are members of Sergeant and Inspector Rank right around the organisation uh, that contributed very freely with their views, uh, in some cases with their constructive criticism, and we listened very, very carefully to that. And we have inputted that, and I have some examples that I, I might use in relation to that. And I know there are some people in this room uh, who contributed very extensively in terms of their views and their experience. So that was really, really important. And as I'm talking, I'm saying we deliberately, because the delivery of such a huge, massive transformation program, it's not just my job, but it's the job of, or even the job of the Assistant Commissioners and the uh, Garda Headquarters, it's the job of absolutely all of us. And I very much see it like that. It is a team effort, and it's going to take collective team endurance to be able to deliver on it. And there's no doubt about it, myself and the management team are responsible and accountable and answerable for its implementation. But we can't make it happen on our own. We have to work together as a team. We have to make sure that all of our Garda members and our Garda staff throughout the organisation play their part too and have that opportunity to play their part. And we are completely committed to that. I know from my meetings with the IC executive that you're very supportive of the change and while we can't agree on everything and we certainly won't agree on all of the minute little details and every single element, I think we all agree and I think we all have the same intention that on Garda Shikhan have become a modern, victim-centred, crime prevention focused police service that focuses on reducing victimisation, improving the service we provide and protecting the communities that we serve. And it, you know, it's in the room that the members that are here can help to make that happen. You are the people at that linchpin 
that actually help the people. And I know in the, in the speech it was said about you know the influence, and you're certainly the people with the influence to make that happen. And I'm very conscious of that. And it's you are the people that I need to be first in the line for ensuring that the transformation happens, but most importantly, it happens in the right way. You are the people who are dealing with issues raised daily by those under your charge, and indeed issues and problems that you've identified yourselves, but most importantly, at that frontline interface with the community, you are the people that hear directly from the community and the people that we serve about what needs to be done. You have the skills to deal with the vast majority of them, and you'll also know that some things require much more in-depth analysis or a different point of view. And your years of experience will tell you when you need a second op uh, opinion and when you need to look at it through a different lens. You've been promoted to frontline management because of those skills and because of the initiative, the ability and the leadership and management skills that you've shown to date. Your management jobs encompass these and much, much more. They encompass leadership too, and empathy, compassion, and understanding. An ability to moderate and discipline matters and be a neutral ear. And I think that's very, very important. Your management task is to translate the ability and drive that saw all of you promoted into a willingness to help turn our Garda Shikana into a leading 21st century policing service. This reform work will be driven and managed centrally with a comprehensive support network available to all of you, but have no doubt that it's your example, your leadership and your skill that Gardaí will be turning to. You are the people that our Garda members, both serving and our new members who are coming through the college, you are the people that they are going to be turning to. Like of all of us when we joined on Garda Shikana and we were all recruits or new students, and the people that we looked up to in the first instance were sergeants and were inspectors that we all worked to. And I said it last year and I'll say it again, and certainly I can say it in my own experience, the people that influenced me most in my career were sergeants and were inspectors that I worked with. And some people who called me to task on a lot of things that I probably would have liked to get away with as a young, enthusiastic and exuberant guard. But I'm asking that you show them there's, so, there's so, no such thing as too little effort or a bad idea. Show them that they work for an organisation that cares for the people they serve. Show them that they can be proud of, of who they work for. And that every day, every single day, will, it will offer them the opportunity, opportunity to do something expe uh, very exceptional and very special. Not many careers offer that. Not many careers allow a young member, by simple dogged application, to change history and vindicate a human being. But that's what a career in a garden should call it allows. And I use that example because it's a very recent example of what I would say is the epitome of professional and dedicated policemen and women that we have every single day. And I'm talking particularly about the people involved in the recent investigation into the Elaine O'Hara disappearance. And I think it's very important to remember that at the outset of that investigation, everybody thought we were dealing with a missing person. And that's how that investigation started out. And if it wasn't for the professionalism and the dedication and the interest of members of the Garda Shikana in following every avenue of inquiry and every avenue of investigation that, that turned up, we may not have had the outcome that we had, and indeed the O'Hara family may not have had the outcome that they had. So when I reflect on the work that was done by our members, and I'm particularly conscious of the investigation team uh, in Black Rock, but also the members of the public who found the items in the reservoir in the first place, but then the dogged determination of Gardner James O'Donoghue when he went back again and again and again, and the manner in which he dealt with those items. And what really struck me watching uh, the uh, programme the other night was the way the first person he turned to was a sergeant. And he went to a sergeant to get advice on what he should do. And I thought that was really, really interesting. And it, just, it was something that I reflected on as I came to the conference here today, because I do not think that we can underestimate the importance of the, the role of the sergeant. And it's amazing that after seven years of being pummeled by the media, of being pummeled by the community, that people have not been sure whether or not they had a, an organisation and people that they could have trust and confidence in. Isn't it absolutely amazing, after all of that criticism, <coughs> how the dogged determination of a group of guards, including the people that tenaciously followed the CCIU and the investigative strands right across the investigation, and went through all of those absolutely tapes and lots and lots of various things, including the work of the analysis service. It's just amazing 
how that demonstrates an example of how the confidence and the trust could be reinforced and re-emphasised. And, you know, it just didn't take that. There's been a lot of work going on in the last 12 months to do that. But for me, that was the catalyst that actually changed it. And, you know, the case itself may be ex exceptional in its surrounding circumstances. But, as I say, it is the kind of commitment that our members, every single day, deliver in every townland, every village, and every city in Ireland, all day, every day. And it's something that allows us to shine a light on the really, really good work that is done by all of our members, all of the time. And for me, it really shows how the fusion of what I would call good old-fashioned police work, modern technology, data analytics, and the services of the analysis service can come together in a way that probably 30 years ago we would never have thought possible to present such complex, complicated evidence to a jury and to be able to convince them that here is all the connections. So I think it's an excellent example and I highly commend all of the members involved in the case. As managers within a service staffed by the brightest and the best, we must provide a policing and national security service by delivering change on an unprecedented scale. And what I mean by that is, it's the twin tracks of policing and security. So business continuity isn't an option for us. We have to keep providing that day in and day out. We have to show and demonstrate that we can continuously improve what we do in the policing and security environment. But at the same time, in the centre of those twin tracks, there's an expectation that we are going to deliver massive transformational change in the way that we go about our business. Unprecedented changes in an organisation like Agarda Shikana doesn't start with somebody like the Commissioner having a light bulb moment. It starts with our people at every level having an input and outlining their expectations to us. And that's what we've been doing over the last 12 months, taking input from all of you, from all of your members and from all of our staff right throughout the organisation. It starts also with the people we serve making demands. So we've been listening to the community. We've started our public attitude survey, uh, we have the first quarter results in and we're due the second quarter results in uh, to make sure that the service that we're providing is actually the service that's expected by the community that we serve. It also starts with looking at the changing demographic of Irish society and the statistics of Irish life. It includes all of that and, and much more. And we need then to look and say how do we prioritise all of those things? How do we prioritise them and how do we, how do we sequence them that doesn't impact on the service that we provide every day to the community? So what we've done is we've looked at it in terms of prioritisation around what has the biggest community impact? What does it mean in terms of the people that we serve? What does it mean in terms of how we're going to modernise the organisation and how are we going to sequence that? And we also have to be very realistic. We have to very, make very thought out, very well crafted cases in terms to make sure that we get the resources that we absolutely need to do the changes that we have to do. So that's some of the things we've, to, uh, we've been doing. But those priorities have to be delivered in a standardised, professional way right across the organisation. So what we have done, and you'll have seen it recently, we've set up a strategic transformation office. When I say we've set it up, we began populating it. It's not finished yet, but it will be finalised within, within the month. And that strategic transformation office is to allow us to bring together all of the programmes of work that we need to do, but also a critical part of it is making sure that we have a communication uh, hub in it that actually keeps everybody in the loop in terms of what's happening and engages with people in a very real way in terms of what's happening. In May, we have 100 new recruits are going out to stations across the country to continue to their training. There's a further 200 students in the college, and actually I think I should take one of that because we have 199 at the moment, in the who will follow on a similar path. They've received training that is innovative, unique, and up to the minute. Training grounded in the day-to-day -day realities of, police, of policemen. And just to warn you, like all of us when we came out of the college first, and particularly for us that are old enough to remember doing part one and part two, when we got to that stage, we thought we knew everything and they will know everything. So it's like the old adage, be careful what you ask for because you're going to get a lot of new students or recruits that will know everything. But hopefully it's going to make your life a bit easier. And I'm very, very confident that that recruitment will continue. And I know that I've been making cases to government and to our own minister in terms of what we need. 
And in terms of standing still, we need 325 students a year. In terms of being able to build the capacity and capability to sustain the organisation into the future, we need to be able to build on that. And I'm very confident uh, that we will, and people have heard us, and I'm very confident that we will get that. In all, serious, no, in all seriousness, though, and I joke about us all knowing everything because none of us ever know everything, no matter where we are, but the influx of new recruits means that we have an injection of fresh blood into the organisation and into our Gardish economy. And recently, when I was in the college, it was great to feel a heartbeat back in college. And when these students go out into new stations, I think we'll feel that heartbeat starting to beat faster again. It's great to see people come in with diverse backgrounds, with new ideas, with new experiences, and looking how they're going to make a difference to the communities they serve, and how they're so excited and so exuberant about getting out on the ground and getting stuck into police work. That really, really enthuses me, and that really reminds me why I joined on Garda Chicana. But I, as I say, I'm very conscious, going back to my own experience, it's going to be your role to shape and guide that new enthusiasm and to curb it at times, and also to share the influx of knowledge uh, when it lands with you. To be able to share your experience, your knowledge, and to be able to provide guidance and direction to these people. It's also going to be your role to remind these people every single day that their learning is not complete. It's a journey, and their learning will never be complete. But it's also your guidance that makes sure that they maximise their potential for the good of the organisation. When it comes to resources, just as we are going to do with the number of route out of students, we'd like to see go through to have more every year. We're making case at the highest levels for more resources, and I include in that people, equipment, cars, ICT, and upgrades of our stations. The Garden Inspectors Report rightly recognised that we're at least 30 years behind when it comes to ICT. So the temptation in that would be for us to go out and rush out and say we want the latest shiny new expensive tech toy, something like my son if he gets into an Apple store with uh, my credit card usually. But instead of that what we're doing is we're taking on board all of the internal and the external reviews. We've developed an ICT vision and a roadmap, an implementation plan for the next five years outlining the priority projects, the benefits, what we believe and when we believe we can deliver them what they're going to cost, and most importantly, what they're going to mean for our own people in terms of the service delivery, but also what they're going to mean for the communities that we serve. We've been guided and assisted in that by an ICT steering group, including the government's chief information officer, because it's very important that we align our transformation plan with the government reform plan to make sure that we're in step and that people understand what it is we're doing and that we're very open and transparent about what it is we're doing. To make sure that we have the support for it, we have representatives from the Department of Justice, but also, most importantly, from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, because they are the people with the purse strings, and we need to convince them that we are worth investing in. But I think it's important that I say ICT forms one part of a much broader transformation agenda. It's an integral part, but only a component part, and this agenda has been finalised. We've taken on board all of the previous programmes of work done by Garda Shikana, including the likes of the GRACE programme. We've looked at all of the previous inspectors' reports, the recommendations of various tribunals, uh, the recommendations of the Ombudsman Commission from various investigations, and all of the whole plethora of uh, initiatives that are going on across other police services. And what we've done is we've distilled what are 638 recommendations from previous reports down into 58 initiatives. Of those 58 initiatives, 24 of them are ICT related and the other 34 are matters which relate to people, processes and procedures and most of them, interestingly, around crime investigation, managing victims of crime and crime prevention. And I know there's been a very significant input from people in this room, particularly in relation to our national crime prevention strategy that we're developing, and I thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a very coordinated, it's a very imaginative plan. When I say imaginative, I don't mean that it's anything outrageous. It's actually, I, I saw something recently in the media where it said that actually all I was doing going back to basics and Robert Peel's um, vision in 1829. It's true. 
because actually it's about making sure that we are, as Robert Peel said, the people are the police and the police are the people. And we're making sure that we continue our community policing ethos and our core philosophy of being of, of working and living in the community. It's making sure that we put crime prevention at the heart of everything we do, that making sure that when people do become victims of crime, that they are treated appropriately, sensitively, with compassion, empathy and understanding. And that when crime does happen, that is properly, professionally and appropriately investigated. And that we do our very best, as we've done in recent cases, to bring the perpetrators of those crimes to justice and that we support the victim all the way through that. As I say, what we're looking to do is we're looking to make Ongarda Shikana fit and purposeful for the 21st century. We want to make sure that we have the modern, efficient technology, process, systems and enablers to make us do that. But we want to make ourselves a service that makes the most effective use of the huge amounts of data we have to ensure that we make sure we put the right people in the right place at the right times. And again, I listen very carefully to the need for a resource allocation and deployment model. And our executive director of HR is working very, very hard on that. I asked him to prioritise it when he came to the organisation first, and that is underway because I'm very conscious of the changing demographic of the organisation in terms of our people, but I'm also conscious of the changing demographic of society, and particularly in terms of the movement of people around the country, especially around the commuter belts. So I want to make sure that we have the right people deployed in the right places. I want to make sure that we're a service that tracks and predicts criminal activity, that responds effectively and proactively to calls from the public and gives our people on the ground the ability to make informed decisions quickly, as close to the front line as possible. A service that provides the public with better access to crime prevention material and different ways to make contact with us and engage with us. And that's something we've probably been a little bit slow in doing in terms of making sure that people can access us, including our own members. In terms of communication with our own members, we need to put mechanisms in place for that. We want to make sure that we're a service that ensures frontline managers such as yourselves have easy access to the data you need when you need it and in the form that you need it. It will give you as managers a better insight into the latest crime patterns and trends in your areas and enable you to collaborate more effectively with our people and our stakeholders. Importantly, and I know it's something that's very close to your hearts and certainly from last year, but it's something we have been working on, and I used an analogy recently, this part is like a tanker that we're trying very slowly to turn around, to try and reduce the burden of administration so people can spend more time in the field rather than stuck behind a desk. But we are a very paper-based organisation. It's taken time to do that. It's taken time to change old habits, which is something that's very important as well, because habits are one of the slowest things to change. But we will have a new approach to delivering ICT and on Garda Shikana, based on what is best for the organisation in the long term, rather than what is expedient or what can be squeezed in under the usual annual budget. So rather than taking little things, we want to make things that will have a big impact on the way that you do your work. This won't solve the issue of paperwork today or tomorrow, but will set out to reduce the bureaucratic burden on you while ensuring we maintain strong oversight and compliance. It's not easy, it's certainly not doable overnight, but we'll get it done, and the most important thing is that we're determined to get it done right. I'm conscious that my uh, time talking to you could be better utilised by listening to you, by speaking with you, uh, instead of at you, and by, most importantly, hearing what is on your mind and what you have to say. So I'm going to wrap up and then take some questions. You know, last year I said to you, I don't have a magic wand, and I don't have something that can make everything all right overnight. In the last 12 months, I didn't manage to find the magic wand, so I still don't have it. So I can't promise you the earth, the moon and the stars, but I know in fairness that is not what you're asking for now, nor is it ever what you've asked for. I won't be able to solve all of the problems uh, you're experiencing in the immediate, and I don't think that would have been possible even during the boom years. But what I can give you is a clear commitment that we're going to change for the better. Initial progress is obvious. We have more than 500 new cars and vans have been introduced to the fleet since this time last year. That's over 500 cars sent to stations around the country that were crying out for them and that needed them badly. Many of those cars are replacing cars when retired and I'm very conscious of that, but we haven't taken our eye off the ball there. It's a start. I know that we need more cars, 
but I, I have to say our fleet is in better condition now than it has been in a good many years. So as I say, it's a start, it's not the end, and we are continuing those conversations. You'll also have seen we recently promoted a number of chief superintendents and superintendents. I'm very conscious, particularly with the promotion of superintendents, of these very critical gaps at frontline supervision level, particularly around inspectors. And I know that we are in dialogue with your own association and the other associations in terms of a mechanism for doing that because we do have a gap in the organisation uh, in terms of allowing us to run those competitions in an expedient way that makes sure that we get people promoted into those positions. And the positions for sergeants are starting. So I'm very delighted with that because I really do value frontline supervision at a sergeant and inspector level. And I want to make sure that from now on, when we have promotions, that we have succession planning, and that there are sergeants and inspectors there to fill the relevant positions. I know people may sit there and say they're not our chatting moves, and certainly no, they're not. What they are is they're building blocks. They're positive steps in the right direction. Some of the changes are going to take much longer than others. Some might fail, and some might not deliver their full promise at the first time of asking. So what I ask for is your patience and your flexibility and your understanding. Sometimes we're going to have to change what our priorities are because there are going to be things visited upon us as we're sitting here today that we don't even envisage as coming down the tracks. So yes, sometimes we're going to have to change those priorities. But what is really important to me is your views and your feedback. And as we roll out the transformation programme and as we get into the implementation phase, <laughs> Your engagement, your feedback and your input will be so important. So that's why I ask uh, from you today. We're also going to, as I say, work much harder to keep you informed and to, as we make the changes and to communicate exactly what we're doing and to have far more engagement uh, in terms of the process as it moves forward. And I was taken again after the Irish male rugby team's recent success. But before I say what I was taken by, I also have to say I was very impressed with the latest success in the rugby. But particularly Joe Schmidt. And I was reading some of Joe Schmidt's comments. And again, it just made me think of our own organisation. Because I do see our organisation as a team. But Schmidt's philosophy of getting little details right, of finding something and being the very best at it. I think we're really, really good at that. We're really good at getting it right, and we're really good at getting the smallest, my, the most minute details right, and I believe we can become the very best at it. We're very good at being focused on the small details, and we're very good at translating that into our own working life, and making sure that we do that while all of these transformational reforms are being delivered, and making sure that we can continue to provide that 21st century police service the country deserves and that we deserve to make sure that we help our members to provide. On my part, I'll continue to fight for increased budgets, resources and new guarding. And being no doubt about that, we have started having very open, very mature and very constructive conversations, and that will continue. I'll absolutely fight for what we need, but I need to also to be very clear on what we have. And what we have are almost 16,000 very hard-working, dedicated, professional people. We have professional, dedicated and committed Garda members, such as the people that I spoke about earlier. We have Garda staff who are positioned supporting those. And we have Garda reserves who are members of the community who volunteer and give up their time to come and help us in the job that we do. A lot of them aspiring to become full-time members of a Garda Chicano. We have people who are willing every single day to go above and beyond their duty. Every single day, on and off duty, we have people who are giving up their all. And again, maybe just picking up on the, the speech earlier. If I use as an example the water protests, many people in this room have members, both yourselves and members who report to you, have experienced unprecedented levels of personal abuse, both in policing situations and through social media. I'm very, very conscious of that. I'm also very conscious of the, resili the resilience that have been, has been demonstrated by our people who've taken it in the course of their duty as part of protecting the right of people in the first instance to democratically protest. But when that democratic protest line is crossed, they take it <coughs> excuse me, in the spirit of actually protecting the communities uh, right throughout the country. And I'm very, very conscious of that. And we have set up, in answer to the question that was answered, asked earlier, we have set up a national operation 
which is coordinating all of the instance right across the country, Operation Mism, and all of those instances will be investigated. And once the facts are established and the evidence has been identified, there will be prosecutions as appropriate taken. And most importantly, we have people who are hungry for change. We have the foundations to ensure that Angarda Shikana becomes a shining beacon for all, for all we serve. And I'm very much counting on you to continue, continue to provide the spark for that beacon. So I thank you again for today's invitation. I'm very happy to uh, take questions and uh, I hope I can answer them all. So thank you very much.